Hi folks, so today I want to talk about a paper by Barbara Lieskoff and Stephen Zillis. It's called Programming with Abstract Data Types. This paper came out back in 1974, and as we will go through it, you will realize just how much of modern programming languages it laid out. You will see many, many similarities between what this paper is laying out in 1974 and the landscape of programming languages as it is today. So this is an absolutely foundational paper in programming languages. So this paper was written at around the same time that other people in computer science were laying out the foundations of structured programming and high level programming languages. And the overarching goal of all these efforts was to raise the level of abstraction in which a programmer is able to think about his or her problem. That enables a programmer to solve the specific problem they are looking at. The issue at the time was that even with the presence of high-level languages and structured programming constructs, the designer of a programming language could not predict all the abstractions which a programmer might need. So then the question becomes, if the high level language which you're working with doesn't give you the abstractions that you need for your particular problem, how are you gonna augment it with abstractions that meet your needs? And that is exactly what this paper talks about, how to augment a high level programming language with new abstractions. Now, before we go any further, we should try and define what an abstraction is and why it is useful. Now here's the best quote from this entire paper, and if you remember nothing else, remember this. An abstraction is a mechanism which permits the expression of relevant details and the suppression of irrelevant details. This bears repeating. It's something which lets you express what is relevant to your program and ignore what is not relevant to your program. That is the definition of an abstraction. The programming languages at the time already had one mechanism that allowed abstraction, and that was the function or the procedure. But a procedure alone was not enough to express all abstractions because it did not abstract out both the data as well as the control structures. And this is what leads the authors to define an abstract data type which is an abstract object or a class of abstract objects which is completely characterized by the operations available on those objects. Now you'll notice that this is very similar to object-oriented programming and classes in object-oriented programming. And that's exactly the point of this paper. And the way this helps with abstraction is that when a programmer uses an abstract data type, they are only concerned with the behavior of that abstract data type, the behavior it displays via the operations that it exposes. The programmer is not concerned with the details of how that behavior is implemented. In concrete terms, the authors are proposing that an abstract data type be specified using a construct called an operation cluster or cluster for short. And this would define all the operations available on an abstract data type. And since this is a totally new construct that didn't exist at the type, the authors are defining a new programming language with syntax that enables this. To demonstrate these ideas concretely, the authors walk through an example program which translates a string from infix notation to Polish or postfix notation. So it would take a string like this, which is an infix, and translate it to a string like this, which is in postfix. Now let's look at this program, which defines how this conversion is done, and look at, in particular, the abstractions which this program uses. So the procedure PolishGen takes an input file and an output file. These are completely abstracted away, and it takes a grammar. What is a grammar? A grammar is an abstract data type that can parse, 
tokens out of the input string and also tell you what precedence the operators are at. It uses a couple of other abstract data types. For example, a token is an abstraction for a single element of the input string. It uses an abstract data type called stack, which is everyone's favorite example. And now see how it refers to all these abstract data types. It's calling a method called EOF of the grammar abstract data type. And here it's checking if a stack is empty. Here it's popping an element from the stack. Here it is getting the symbol for a token. Here it is pushing an element onto a stack. So I'm sure all this is beginning to look very familiar because this looks very similar to a modern object-oriented programming language where grammar and stack and token are defined as classes with all these operations. The syntax might be a little different, but you can see that the ideas are very similar. One special thing I want to call out here is that the stack abstract data type takes as an argument the type of the elements that it contains. So this stack over here contains elements of type token. So this is even using what today we would understand as generic data types. Now this language is strongly typed and so it puts restrictions on how these abstract data types can be used and passed around. For example, if you use it as an argument to a procedure, the types must exactly match. If you assign it to a variable, again, the types must exactly match. Note that they are not defining any concept of inheritance yet. There's no concept of passing in subtypes and so on. As we saw in the example before, we can invoke operations by specifying the data type, the operation, and the specific variable on which that operation is working. So now that we have defined a procedure for converting from infix to polish that uses several abstract data types, let's look at how exactly we define each abstract data type. And the authors here look at how to define the stack data type. It takes one argument, which is the type of the element in the stack. It uses this keyword called is to define all the operations supported by the stack abstract data type. In this case, push, pop, top, erase, top, and empty. And now we can see how the rest of this data type is actually implemented. They're defining a keyword called rep, which defines the internal representation of this data type. And this internal representation is completely hidden from users of this abstract data type. This is very important to understand. The internal implementation details are completely hidden. There's another keyword called create, which defines how to create an object of this abstract data type. And now you'll see how all the other operations are defined. Push increments the top of the stack and puts an element in. Pop does the reverse. It checks if a stack is empty and so on. But this will look really familiar to anyone who's seen a modern object-oriented programming language. Controlling the use of information in terms of hiding internal implementation details was one of the most important design goals of this. The whole point of abstraction was to free the programmer from worrying about irrelevant internal implementation details. And in this particular example, where we're converting from infix to polish, token is a data type that was created entirely to hide internal implementation details of how a grammar implements various tokens in that grammar. The alternative would have been for the Polish and procedure to work with raw strings. But this is not important to what that procedure is trying to do. It doesn't matter how the grammar represents tokens. So that procedure does not need to deal with raw strings. With the token and grammar abstractions, we've also limited the scope of where errors can be introduced. 
For example, if there's an error with the precedence relation, we know that the error must have been in the token or the grammar cluster because the Polish N procedure doesn't deal with that at all. And all this is to say is that this program was designed according to one of Dijkstra's principles, which is build the program one decision at a time. The other advantage of doing this is that it is much easier to reason about the program and to prove it correct. You divide your proof into two parts. In the first part, you prove that your abstractions function correctly and you prove that your higher level logic that uses those abstractions is then correct. Once you've done that, in the second part, you can go one level deeper and try to prove your underlying abstractions correct. Lieskov and Zillis compare the proposal in this paper with some other streams of research around that time. I won't go into all of them in detail, but I think one of the biggest things that sets this paper apart is the focus on information hiding. The constructs that they've proposed here completely hide internal implementation details. Getting into how such a construct might actually get implemented in a compiler, one interesting part to zoom in on is type checking because they're effectively implementing generic data types. So as they say here, type checking is made complex because abstract data types may have types as parameters. And the problem with this is that a type generator, which is their term for a data type that takes another type as an argument, defines an open-ended class of types. These members are not known at compile time. And this also gives rise to polymorphism because some of the operations that we use on a parameter type may be defined over many different type domains. And we can use them as long as all those types consistently define the operations that we are assuming of that parameter type. So what this boils down to is that, yes, compile time type checking is preferable, but because of these generic types, they fall back on runtime type checking. So to conclude, this paper proposed a new abstraction building mechanism so that high level languages can be augmented with new abstractions relevant to a problem domain. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.